experience in flexible utroscopy in next 20-25 minutes. So when we talk about surgical treatment of renal stone disease, uh, there are two most important factors that we need to consider. Those are stone clearance and morbidity. So the ideal surgical modality for treatment of renal stone would be the one with very high stone clearance or highest stone clearance with no morbidity, which is not possible at the at the present scenario. But we all know that surgical modalities for renal stone has been evolving very fast in last one, one and a half decades. There has been lots of changes. And we know that open, though the open surgery has very good stone clearance rate because of its highest or higher morbidity, uh, the, the open surgery is not very popular among patients and surgeons these days. So uh, we need something with higher stone clearance and minimal morbidity and RIRS is one of them. So in next few minutes, I'll be discussing few factors like uh, stone factors, patient factors, stone factors like size, locations, uh, and other uh, factors like scopes that we use for flexible utroscopy, lasers and accessories and skill of the surgeon whether all these factors affects in stone clearance or not. So what we think is uh, we have now uh, the most recent EAU guideline of 2020 in this March only recently, few days back. Uh, and uh, the indication and uh, the, uh, the indication of RIRS is very crucial and very first step that we should consider when we, we talk about success of uh, the procedure. As we all know, RIRS stands very strong uh, among all the surgical modalities for the treatment of renal stones, like except in stone size more than 20 mm, in all other conditions, RIRS stands in uh, in the first, as a first options, recommended options for treatment of renal stone. So when we talk about stone free after any procedure, there are some factors or there are some, uh, there are some uh, things that we need to consider like uh, how do we define the stone free rate? The definition of stone free status has been very heterogeneous in uh, in uh, literature, some has defined stone free when there is even four to five mm of fragments left after procedure. But some authors are have been very strict, and they think there there should not be any fragment left to call it as stone free. So definition of stone free is very tricky. And another factor that uh, that plays a role in defining stone free is which modality has been used to uh, to see the residual fragments is it an ultrasound alone or x-ray kuv alone or combination of ultrasound and x-ray kuv or plain plain ct kuv definitely plain ct kuv has highest sensitivity and specificity but Performing CTKB after all stone procedure, after every stone procedures, especially in this part of the world, even in the developed country is not always feasible because of the economic and radiological uh, factors. So most of the published literature, they have done ultrasound or X-ray KUB or combination of ultrasound and X-ray KUB rather than CTKB to assess the stone free rate. There has been few there, there are few papers that access, that assist stone free rate with CTKUB, but they are very few in numbers. Another factor uh, that plays role in defining st stone free is timing of imaging. Whether it has done on the very same day or next day, or has been done after two weeks, four weeks, three months. Or some in some some uh, published literature, they have access stone free rate even after 365 days, and this heterogeneity has made problem in defining stone free rate. 
So let's discuss some stone factors that can affect the uh, stone free after stone free rate after flexible utroscopy. So there are various stone factors like stone size as uh, most of the guidelines they, they say that uh, flexible utroscopy should not be done or should not be routinely done for stone size more than two centimeter and the number of stones location of the stones hardness of the stones also plays a role when we do uh, stone surgery so these days recently rather than stone size in one dimension the largest dimension of the stone is not very much preferred uh, over the stone volume because as we all know the largest dimension of the stone may not be uh, um, uh, may not uh, <clears throat> fully represent the volume of the stone so if we take an example of two centimeter stone largest uh, dimension two centimeter stone but the um, another dimension is if it is 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 the stone volume will be 0 0.5 centimeter cube whereas another stone with two centimeter uh, dimension in all three uh, aspects the the stone volume will be eight centimeter cube and the difference between same two centimeters in the longest diameter stone two different stone the difference will be 16 times higher and this factor plays a very big role in treatment of uh, renal stone especially with eswl and flexible utroscopy rirs so i think uh, the stone volume will predict more in terms of stone clearance operative duration rather than largest dimension of the stone so i think in future we should uh, we should start reporting stone size as uh, mm, not stone size but stone volume as the um, uh, uh, factor or uh, stone factor for treating the uh, renal stone so what happens when we do a uh, larger stone with uh, flexible utroscopy there are uh, there are few studies even from india there are studies uh, where where uh, flexible utroscopy or rs was, was used to treat larger stones even stag on stones uh, but uh, in literature, there are, uh, this is the meta-analysis of 10 studies uh, where 561 patients were included and the mean size of the stone was 2.8 centimeter. Uh, after first procedure, after primary procedure, the stone free rate was 56.8%. And mean procedure, uh, the number of procedures needed to make it stone free was more than one in most of the cases. And after after multiple or after auxiliary procedure the stone free rate went up to 86 percent from this study what we can say that if we treat stones larger than two centimeter then the probability of necessary necessity of uh, multiple sessions of rirs is high so another this is a another study from crow's group uh, published in journal of urology in 2015 uh, what they have concluded is if we treat 10 centim 10 millimeter stone uh, with uh, rirs the stone free rate can go up to 90 percent whereas if the stone is 15 mm the stone free rate goes little down to 80 percent and there are uh, stones treated with flexible utroscopy which are more than 20 millimeter but the stone free rate is as low as 30 percent apart from that in those subgroup of patients, the incidence of fever was quite high, significantly high. The rate of retreatment and rehospitalization is also high. So, uh, what we can conclude uh, from this is, if we are planning for uh, flexible urethroscopy uh, for the bigger bigger stone, um, for now twenty millimeter stone and bigger we should always counsel for second session we should counsel for uh, higher fever rate longer hospitalizations uh, to the patient 
and we should prepare accordingly. So uh, there are various scoring systems uh, uh, that that are used to predict the stone free rate after uh, flexible electroscopy, but they are just reported and they are not externally validated uh, so till date. So they are not recommended uh, uh, scoring systems till date. So I'm not going into details about these scoring systems. So talking about uh, stone locations, uh, lower pole stones always have been considered different uh, entity when we talk about renal stones. In guidelines also there are specific, uh, there are different uh, guidelines for lower pole stones. Uh, all three modalities, PCNL, SOCWIB and RARS can be used in lower pole stones but with some, some modifications. So when we treat lower pole stone with flexible utroscopy, uh, all the modern uh, scopes, they have very good deflections up to 270, 275 degree deflection upwards and downwards. But what we should remember is there will be some loss of deflections with some uh, with accessories in the working channel. So if we use any working uh, any accessories in the working channels, be it a, a nitinol basket or laser fiber, there will be some loss in deflections. So the loss of deflection depends upon the which accessories are we using. So, so when we are treating lower pole stone, we recommend uh, to use smaller uh, fiber, laser fiber, smallest possible laser fiber or smallest available laser fiber in your setup so that the deflection of the scopes becomes minimal. And the loss of deflection of the scope is highest with steel basket, which is not used in um, flexible utroscopy these days, but nitinol baskets, they, they, uh, they are uh, best with uh, flexible utroscopy because they cause less loss in deflections. So use uh, smaller laser fiber, uh, preferably 200, 273 micron, when treating uh, lower pole stone and use small uh, nitinol basket to uh, displace the stone if needed. So which scope is better uh, for lower pole stones? Uh, there was one interesting study <coughs> from Petra group uh, in Europe published in Journal of Andrology and they, they have compared various scopes uh, uh, to access which is better to access, uh, which is better to use for lower pole, uh, lower pole access. And they have found that fiber optic scopes are, have better access than digital scopes because digital scopes are slightly bulkier and tip deflections of the di digital sco scopes is poorer than fiber optic scopes. And among fiber optic scopes, Flex X2 from Carl Stroh's is, has the better, better uh, accessibility to, towards difficult lower pole stone. So from this, uh, we can say that if you want to purchase, if you want to obtain a single scope, reusable single scope, and if you have a, I mean, good number of cases of lower pole stone, then uh, if you want to have only one scope, if, or if you can afford only one scope, then it is better to have fiber optic scopes uh, to, to reach all the calyces in the kidney. So uh, when we treat uh, lower pole stones with uh, flexible utroscopy, uh, there is a unique features of flexible utroscopy that can convert lower pole stone to non-lower pole stone, uh, which is not possible in uh, PCNL and uh, ESWL. So I find it very unique when we talk about lower pole stone. We can displace the lower pole stone with the use of flexible utroscopy and uh, utroscopes and uh, baskets and make it non-lower polar stones by uh, relocating it in uh, favorable mid or upper calyx. At this point, I just want to highlight that when we displace the stone from the lower pole, uh, the upper pole may not always be favorable calyx for you for further treatment of the stone. I mean, some lower, uh, upper pole calyx can be difficult in terms of access, 
and further disintegration of the uh, stones with laser. So before relocating the stone from the lower pole, what I uh, do is I access all the uh, calyxes, including middle and upper calyx, and uh, find out which calyx is more ergonomically more suitable to displace and to treat the stone further. So it is very important sometimes when after displacing the stone in the upper pole, we, 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 find, out, we find that the upper pole is not very ergonomically uh, feasible to uh, your, your hand is more, more I mean, uh, rotated, you find very uh, difficult to uh, treat the stone in the upper pole. So assessing the, all the um, calyx before relocation is very important. So another question is treatment of the lower pole stone in situ and after relocation, which is better? I mean, treatment uh, in situ and uh, treatment after relocation, does it make any difference in um, uh, outcome? So uh, there is a paper from Suster et al. in 2002. It's a, a bit uh, uh, old paper. And they have compared uh, in situ versus displacement for lower pole stone. And what they have found is uh, uh, if the stone size is less than one centimeter, the stone free rate is almost similar. It's 77% in situ versus 89% uh, in uh, displacement uh, group but it, it was not statistically significant according, according to them. But if the stone size is uh, in between one to two centimeter, then the displacement uh, is of course better than uh, treatment, treating the stone in situ. Uh, they found that the in displacement group, the stone free rate is almost 100% and in situ uh, treatment group, the stone free rate is only 29%. But the problem with this study is uh, in this group in uh, in the cohort of one to two centimeter size stone, the sample size is very small. It's seven cases in each group. So I think um, uh, to conclude that displacement is better with uh, comparison of seven cases will be uh, too uh, early. And another problem with this paper is uh, the EHL as a uh, energy was also used in displacement group. So there is a heterogeneity. There is a difference in uh, I mean uh, um, uh, uh, Holmium Yag laser and EHL used in two different two different uh, groups. So the success uh, of displacement uh, is questioned because of these factors. So since there are uh, very uh, few uh, evidence uh, regarding whether relocation is better or in, in situ is, uh, is better or is, are they same, uh, since the literature is very few, we conducted a prospective uh, randomized study in our department comparing in situ versus relocation in for uh, lower pole stone of less than 20 millimeter. And we found that uh, it's a still ongoing study and we found that the stone free rate uh, is almost similar in situ uh, group. The stone free rate is 89% with relocation group 91%. Stone size uh, were comparable. Stone volume and the uh, hardness of the stone in both group were also comparable. Still, um, the sample size in our study is also not very big, but this is an ongoing study, and we need more and more multicentric or larger study to um, uh, conclude that uh, are both the techniques are same or is any uh, are they any superior to other? So. Uh, Talking about laser, which uh, which laser, what kind of laser is uh, good for the good to have uh, the better uh, stone clearance in flexible utroscopy? I think um, there will be more discussion on laser, but uh, there are two uh, burning questions uh, at at the moment: Do we need high power laser or low power laser? Holmium Yag laser if, is efficient for laser lith lithotripsy. And the second question is uh, the emerging thulium fiber laser and holmium yag laser, which which is better uh, be, uh, better for treatment of renal stone. 
So uh, when we compared lower and high power laser uh, <clears throat> among uh, 120 patients, what we found is uh, stone free rate with both lower and high power laser uh, are same, but the only significant difference between these two groups are uh, in high power laser, the, there is a significantly high energy used per millimeter cube of the stone. That means we get similar result with low and high power laser, but we use more energy when we use high power laser. We use 125 uh, watt uh, holmium laser from Luminous. Uh, and what does that mean? If we use very significantly high energy uh, for treatment of stone, we hit the, we hit the uh, water around the fiber tip and inside the pelvic calicial system and the rise in temperature may be uh, tremendously high which can affect uh, the um, kidney and we need more evidence that high power laser or high energy use during laser lithotripsy is not harmful so uh, from this preliminary study what we can say that with a low power holmium yag laser, we can achieve similar stone free rate as we uh, achieve from high power laser. So, uh, thulium fiber laser is a new laser. It, it is considered a, as a powerful laser, but it, we should understand that uh, thulium fiber laser is different from yag laser. It's not thulium yag laser. So, the mechanism is totally different. I think it's still in early or preclinical phase. And the comparison of holmium YAG laser and thulium fiber laser in terms of stone clearance is not yet uh, come. So we need uh, more studies with a, a good comparison of thulium fiber and holmium YAG laser in terms of stone clearance. So uh, laser machine, uh, there is uh, no doubt that holmium YAG laser is still a gold standard for laser lithotripsy. But uh, there are certain things that we should learn and we should uh, know about laser techniques to achieve a good stone clearance. Uh, if we put our laser fiber very far from the stone during laser lithotripsy, it won't work. Your laser energy is being wasted. You are just heating the water around the fiber tip and you are not lasing the stone. That means we should understand the water absorption coefficient of holmium yag laser. That is uh, it's less than 4 mm. So if we put our fiber far farther than 3 to 4 mm, your laser lithotripsy is not very efficient. And at the same time, if we touch the fiber, touch the stone with the fiber, what happens? It's also not um, recommended because if you touch the stone with the fiber, they, then your fiber gets bond back and the stone is also uh, retropulsed and it moves and your, 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 uh, there is a chance that you will damage your uh, blast shield if you are using high energy with a very hard stone. So staying very far and staying too close is also not recommended. So what you should learn, what we should learn during laser lithotripsy is maintaining that golden distance to have an efficient laser, uh, lithotripsy. If you, if you learn how to maintain that distance between 1 to 2 mm, for laser, laser lithotripsy, then you produce good dust. The stone movement is less and uh, the retropulsion is also less. And since we are using uh, more and more of reusable fiber, the life of fiber is also extended. I mean, it, it gets prolonged. If you don't touch the stone, if you don't use high, high power, then your fiber uh, bond bag is also less. So maintaining golden distance is very important to achieve efficient lith uh, lithotripsy. So uh, uh, to do a good dusting, there are a few uh, tricks that we should learn. Don't touch the stone with the fiber. Keep on moving. Don't stay at the one, uh, one place. Stay one to two millimeter away from the stone and move constantly from surface to the center and don't make holes. All this trick will help us to create fine dust. Another important tips to do a good dusting is don't break the stone very initially. Just decrease the height and keep the surface area same so that uh, you, you create a very thin uh, crust or thin um, uh, stone at the end and you do 
pop dusting or pop corning to achieve finer dust so if you uh, follow all these steps then uh, you uh, we will be we will be able to achieve uh, very fine dust and the if the dust are finer the stone clearance is better so uh, another factor another question that we always discuss uh, which which is the better option whether uh, complete dusting or total basketing gives us better stone clearance there are very few uh, evidence on that. There is a paper from uh, AIDS group published in 2018. Pro they prospectively compared dusting versus basketing. Uh, what they have found is basketing has uh, high stone free rate, which is immediate high stone free rate immediately after the procedure. But the long term, the stone free rate between these two groups are same. The complication is also same. The only positive finding they found was the uh, higher or longer operative time associated with basketing group. So what we can conclude, uh, what they have concluded from their study is both the basketing and dusting uh, technique gives uh, excellent surgical outcomes in skilled hands. So it's very important to learn both the techniques and combination of dusting and basketing and tailored to the individual stone compositions provides optimal outcomes and efficiency. So what we should remember is not, uh, 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 not only basketing or dusting uh, uh, gives, uh, gives the better result. We should learn to do proper basketing, dusting, and popcorning. All, all three techniques should be learned to achieve, to achieve better stone clearance because none of them are superior to other. So, what about the accessories? Is the use of uh, access seats gives uh, us better stone clearance? There are few uh, studies that has been conducted to see whether stone stone clearance is better with the use of access seat or not. Obviously, use of access seat um, uh, is associated with extra cost, but uh, uh, there was a study from Crow's group in 2015. Uh, they have studied more than 2000 patients uh, uh, in two groups and the stone free rate with or without access seat was same so uh, till date uh, there is no evidence that use of access seat can give us better stone clearance so what about the scopes then uh, the use of digital and fiber optic scopes it's very obvious that uh, digital scopes uh, gives us better vision some degree of comfort to surgeon but as we have mentioned earlier digital scopes are a little bulkier uh, we need uh, we need a larger access seat if you are using one and the cost of digital scopes are very high uh, but uh, from the literature we can say till that that there is no evidence that uh, digital scopes gives better stone clearance the only benefit with the use of digital scopes is uh, the there is a uh, slight and, uh, uh, decrease in op operation time with the use of digital scopes whereas stone clearance in both the digital and fiber optic scopes are are same what does uh, surgical experience uh, has to do with the stone clearance during flexible atroscopies the, the, there are not much evidence but there are papers from japan and from Italian group. And uh, the most recent uh, paper published in Ural Dithiasis in 2007 from Italian group, they have concluded and they have compared uh, two groups, young surgeons who have done only uh, less than 100 uh, utroscopy versus uh, senior surgeons, senior endourologists who have done more than 400 cases. And what they have found is complications and operative time are the significant significant factors uh, among these two groups whereas stone free rates are slightly higher in experience group but it was not statistically significant uh, i hope you all are staying safe and thank you thank you for your patient listening thank you